I'm Lorelai. And I am Leah. Welcome on I'm an Equestrian podcast. We founded this podcast two years ago, and today we are thrilled to release this new episode in English. In this podcast, we chat with great equestrians and seek to better understand our sport. What is it to be a horseman? What does it cost? What do they dream of? We hope that each of our episodes will participate to strengthen your passion for horses and to empower you as a horse lover, a horse rider, and a person. Shall I introduce our guest, Juan Matute Guimon, the rising star of international dressage? We met Juan for the first time last year during New World Cup, and that day we both were struck by the positivity and brightness he conveys everywhere he goes. Even in the middle of the arena, Juan will be all smiling, sharing good vibes with the judges and the public around him. However, if you know Juan's story, you then know that his journey was not spared from bad days. In this episode, we talked about his life from Spain to the USA, where he spent most of his teenage life. We tried to better define his personality to understand how he manages to always find positivity out of failures and setbacks, and we talked about his ambition and dreams. If you like this episode, do not forget to share it with friends and to send us your thoughts about such an illuminating discussion. Today's episode is sponsored by Flexon. We could tell you how much we both like our Flexon stirrups. We could try to say how innovative and disruptive their range is. And I could tell you some of the wonderful memories and experiences I've had while working at Flexon for three years. But for today, we'll just let somebody else share his vision about the brands. Hey, everybody. I'm Juan Matute Rimon. Uh, before you listen to our conversation, I'd like to talk to you about my partner, Flex On. So I met them through uh, Tienda Ipica Pinol. It's a Spanish equestrian shopping center in Madrid. They had talked to, to me about this brand and how great they are and their serves and how their, their technology uh, with the spikes in the, in the bottom of the serves uh, helps prevent uh, the serve from sliding. And even though at first I was a bit hesitant, I ended up uh, trying them and I fell in love with them from the second I got on the saddle and I placed my feet inside the stirrups. So the relationship that I have with them as a team is uh, fantastic. I met with Matthew Roques in Aachen 2021 and from the moment that we, that we met, I could already tell that, that we were a team. We had a great, great relationship already because of the partnership that we began early 2021. And I, I like that, you know, in, in partnering with people that represent brands such as Flex On. And uh, uh, these stirrups have influenced my riding in the sense that they're, they're light, they are sporty, uh, and they are, yeah, they're, they're cool. The latest product that I have from them, more dressage influenced, and is not only a cool stir, but it's also a beautiful one, you know, with the shiny silver. I'm very, very happy with these products, and I, I would recommend them to everyone all around the world to test them, to see for themselves, to see whether the, the spike system helps them to prevent the stirrup from sliding and it gives them some more stability, but still having a light weight and uh, being nice and sporty. So I encourage everyone to test them and uh, to get the pair for themselves. So you've got it all. Flexon is a French brand that was created by Laurent and Caroline Bolds. The range includes stirrups, boots and also a saddle now. And trust me, the team is as cool and dynamic as their range is innovative. Leah and I, we run a communication agency and manage communication for three riders at the moment. All of them are now partnering with Flexon and we are always impressed by how kind and responsive their team is when handling riders' requests. Well, time to listen to Juan Matute Guimon now. Enjoy your listening. Hello, Juan. Hola. Well, we will <laughs> <laughs> we'll start this conversation by thanking you for accepting our invitation with so much kindness. Of course, how, how could I not accept uh, from French uh, people such as yourself? Super kind. This interview is the very first of our Wellington trip, and we are really happy to get to be recording with <laughs> you here. Juan, you are 24 years old, yes. you were born in Spain, but you have settled here in Wellington a couple of years ago, if I'm right. Mm -hmm. This move was part of your plan to dedicate your life to dressage and to become a professional rider. And, and, to, reach the, and to reach the elite of the sport, because as, I, as we all know, the, the, the very best of our sport live in Europe, and uh, being a Spanish uh, citizen, of course, uh, I would have to go back to Europe. 
And we can say that this has been a success since uh, you are already are one of the best dressage riders in the world <laughs> and with a promising future ahead of you. So let's dive into your story. Can mm. you tell us how all of this started? How and when did you start reading? And at what point did you understand that horse riding would be your job? Okay, so I started when I was, uh, I believe, uh, six or seven years old, uh, riding ponies uh, with my sister. But at first, I did not like uh, horses. I just liked uh, the typical sports that uh, young men uh, do, uh, soccer. I liked also tennis. I liked the swimming. I liked the running. I, I did not really like uh, horses. Uh, but then uh, my po this this pony called Caramelo uh, would every single time I would go see my sister riding would buck her off every single time. And one day in my taekwondo outfit, I believe we have a video off of it. I told my father, Dad, I want to get on top of this horse and, and show him respect. I, I want him to not uh, throw my sister off. And uh, and my father was laughing. And he said, Okay, sure, uh, you can get on and and just try. You no, know, you can just try to ride. And I I got on. He nearly nearly bucked me off also. Uh, but I believe that that was the first memory that I have uh, off, of, off of him and off of my career. And then little by little, six years old, I began doing show jumping, I began competing, I became uh, actually Spanish national champion. In uh, show jumping? In show jumping, yes. Oh. Uh, in ponies. Pony A, you know, the, the, the first yeah, A ponies. And uh, then I did eventing for a couple of years and then I became, uh, you know, with, with the fire inside of me, with the uh, spark. It became for dressage because it was at the, at the 2008 Olympics in Beijing. I accompanied my father uh, to the, uh, all the main shows um, and uh, because of the career to try to make it in the team. And uh, it, was, uh, it was at Aachen 2008 that I knew that I wanted to become a dressage writer because I saw Totilas. Oh, yeah. With Edouard Gall. And that was such an elegant combination. Pwah, I, I, I felt starstruck. And uh, of course, after 2008, I, so I said to my father, Dad, I want to be like you. I want to be a dressage a writer. And I began, uh, yeah, writing and competing. And here we are now. So you were born in a family where, like, horse riding was kind of the norm. Like, mm -hmm. everyone would be riding. Your father participated to three Olympic Games. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. He, he, he qualified for three Olympic Games, and he was the uh, reserve for the Olympics in Beijing 2008. Okay. So nearly four. Okay. Have you ever imagined you could pursue another career, you know, than a one related with horses? Okay. At, at first, uh, of course, I had the goal of uh, just having fun. You know, I just uh, would ride in the afternoons after school with the goal of uh, enjoying and having a good time. Uh, but uh, little by little, I, I became, uh, yeah, more with, with the goal of becoming a professional and uh, making it in the top sport. But never would I have imagined uh, that I would make it so quickly, you know, I'm, like you've just said, I'm, I'm 24. This is uh, quite, uh, you know, quite, quite, quite rare, even though that nowadays uh, there's many young uh, riders uh, that are making it in the top sport, but the average is 40, 45, you know, of uh, top Olympic uh, riders and top sport uh, riders, because I'm not Olympic yet. <laughs> not yet. Not, okay, not yet. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's uh, every day, it's, it's a humbling experience. I like to say, and uh, I'm just enjoying every single day and uh, enjoying it with my buddies, with my, with my horses, my team, and having a good time and uh, just sharing it with my, my audience, with the people that follow me and the people that love me, my family members, and uh, just, you know, enjoying, having a good time. Juan, you turned 24 last November, mm -hmm. and as for many top-level sportsmen, your life is nothing like a regular life of a guy in his 20s. Yeah. Could we talk about your daily life? We know mm -hmm. how hard is it to reach to the top-level sports and the sacrifices that come along with such a journey. Yeah. Do you feel that you are sacrificing a lot of things to be able to perform in your sport? Okay. Uh... Uh, a lot of things, uh, okay, I, I don't know if it's a lot of things because I, I get to have uh, pretty much a normal life other than, of course, the, the weeks that I'm competing, I'm traveling, I'm doing sport. And the thing is that about our uh, profession, th there's a lot of focus that uh, needs to, you know, play in. And uh, that, of course, takes away from a regular young, uh, young, pe young people's uh, life, uh, lifestyle. Uh, because, of course, p young people like to go partying, young people like to travel, young people like to just, you know, have a good time. And uh, with, the, with the sport, and especially with the dressage, with, this, with the equestrian uh, sport, it, it's a lot, of, a lot of focus and a lot of uh, dedication and long days, uh, early mornings. And uh, as, as we all know, it's, it's tough. Uh, but um, when you're enjoying it and when you're having a good time and, and when you know that this is the, the life that was meant to be for you, you're, you're just happy, you know, doing it and it's not, it's not an effort. 
but uh, okay, I also like to have some fun, <laughs> and uh, occasionally I also go out uh, and party and celebrate. Like of course this this weekend after the victory that we had in yeah. the in the four star, that was uh, huge, ladies. That was crazy. We wanted to talk about it. If we want, we can talk about it now. Okay, of course, <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, Okay, like this, this is gonna be a mess, but no worries. Um, so you won the, the Grand Prix freestyle last week in here in Wellington, mm -hmm. and um, we know that the last couple of years were a challenge for you. You had to stop. You you were hospitalized, and we were going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And this was last week was one of the first performance you had, like a major one since your accident. So. No, 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 no. Which no, no, ones? No. Like, okay, I've, I've done already 2021. Um, yeah, sure. I, I did a, a very competitive uh, season because I was trying to qualify for yeah, sure. the Olympic Games, you know, for mm -hmm. Tokyo. Um, and I, I, I did many big shows like Hagen. I also did Compiègne. I also did, uh, you know, um, the show in Munich, which we won okay. actually in the freestyle. And we also did Aachen. We, you know, we did quite uh, okay, a good season. Research. <laughs> but, uh, but we did not achieve our goal yeah. of qualifying for the Olympic Games. And of course, we also did not make it in the team for the Europeans. So those were two big disappointments, big letdowns. But uh, the following morning that I had the news that I wasn't going to be in the team, I woke up with a thought in my mind that, okay, I'm going to make it in the next year teams I want to make it in the World Cup final uh, and I want to make it uh, of course to Leipzig and uh, to the you know World Equestrian Games in and to Paris and to Denmark of course and with the goal from the day that I was told that I wasn't going to be in the team for Tokyo I said okay you know what all right so be it my next goal will be Paris and I will be making it into the Paris uh, team I don't know if it's if it will be with Quantico or if it will be with a different horse because he will be 18 by the time uh, but I, I know that if in, in this sport and in life, I, I know that I'm young and I know, I know that it will be a bit strange for, for such a young man to say this, but you must be uh, dedicated and you must be focused in the goal and belief and have the dreams and uh, to turn them into a reality, uh, you know, and to turn them, uh, to make them come true. You must have the goal and work every single day with, with you know, trying to get a step closer and trying to improve and trying to learn always. So how do you feel when you when you win a class like the one you, you won uh, on Friday, how is it in your mind? Is it emotional? Is it, are you proud or are you um, just um, glad because you think it's, a, it's one step forward to your goal? How, how do you think about it? Yeah. I'm very, I'm very competitive. You know, it doesn't matter who's uh, riding in the class, in the test uh, with me. I always want to win. Even if it's Isabel Werth or Patrick Kittel or Dorothy Schneider, I also just want to win. And I, or at least I would like to get as close as I can to the victory. And that just makes me, you know, imp improve my, my technical side. And in the freestyles, of course, it brings out the special charm. It brings out the special uh, skills. Uh, and uh, that makes the scores go up. And... Uh, but okay, of course, I have to be humble because this is a sport that, as you as you both know, it's uh, many years, you know, and it, it it will take a long time for me to really be able to make it in the in the high uh, in the high end of the sport. But uh, I, I believe that with with a goal in mind, you can always just ride and and continue striving for the best. And uh, I, I believe that I just I got carried away from your your question, <laughs> but uh, that's okay. Don't what? worry. Okay, all right. If, if you're fine with my answer, if you're fine with my answer, it's okay. In 2018, you mm -hmm. chose to get back to Spain to study international relations in yes. Madrid and decided to settle in Europe. Can you tell us a little bit about this decision to get back and start studying at the university? Mm -hmm. uh, was getting a degree some mandatory move for you? Um, okay, so I began studying in Penn State uh, in 2017, I want to say. Yeah, 2017, ending of 2017. I began studying at Penn State, and then, of course, I moved uh, to Europe in 2018. And then with the time zone difference, it, it just did not make sense for me to continue being enrolled in, in the U.S. Uh, college, university. Uh, and then I switched uh, exactly to uh, study uh, business and uh, in international relations. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it, I liked, the thing is that I always liked to combine, you know. I liked to combine uh, sport with a career of uh, just cultural knowledge uh, because it's something that I've always uh, valued. 
Um, and uh, but of course, it was 2019. Then the pandemic in 2020, my brain bleed, and then everything that happened afterwards. And then once I, I woke up and I be, I recuperated uh, my life like I was, I w had just the goal of making it in the Olympic Games in Tokyo. And then of course, my studies were completely on pause; they were on the side. Uh, but who knows if I will uh, continue uh, with it in the future? Because the thing is, I have a, a very interest in in different topics, you know, uh, and uh, not just horses, not just uh, the sport, and uh, but also the business. And uh, I love politics, I love uh, culture, I, I love traveling, I love seeing the world, I love the geography, and it's something that is always, I believe, instilled in me. And who knows if in the future I will. Uh, Get, go again to college because at, this, at the end of the day there's no age limit so you can always go back and, and study can you already think of a new chapter in your career or do you think you are going to remain focused on your writing uh, I, I, I don't know but uh, because there, there's so many uh, business opportunities in the horse world and in the horse sport I would think that it would make more sense to just stay and, and, and to continue of course pursuing my, my goals as a rider and make it uh, in, in the business and has horse sales and uh, who knows maybe if I start in the future a, a personal brand uh, pff, I, I have no idea but uh, there's so many opportunities you know and the thing is that it's a, it's a niche and I, I love this uh, community I love this sport and I love the uh, question uh, world and uh, who knows so uh, I'd like to talk about like Hubert as a person as an individual because we just started you said that you were very competitive yeah. you said um, that you're very resilient also and we know mm -hmm. that um, and there's something that like kind of surprised us when we saw you riding in Lyon mm -hmm. you were all you know smiley and okay maybe not eccentric but you were very expressive yeah. in, in the arena and um, you won't be surprised if I tell you that very often uh, dressage riders or, or the dressage world is seen as something very formal, boring and boring, formal boring yes yeah, yeah, yeah. and can you tell us about you is this something that you really want you know to be walking out of the lines and to be uh, adding some fun and some extra you know extra smile to dressage yes uh, i believe that it's it's part of the youth it's part of our uh, charisma you know it's part of our personality also uh, in in the young people you know the the, the passion the the competitiveness, the ambition to try to strive for uh, good good percentages, good uh, scores, and to challenge uh, the older riders. This is just a part of the youth. And um, but of, of course, I also like to make it uh, clear, you know, that to the audience and to the judges, especially that I'm having a good time and that I'm enjoying it. But at the same time, it is very true, you know, that I'm having a great time and and that Quantico is giving me great feelings and I'm just happy and that's why I smile because I can share it with the, with the public and with the judges. You seem to be a very positive and optimistic person. When we <laughs> see you here, like when you uh, welcomed her over there um, by the lake and, mm -hmm. and now uh, recording and when we saw you riding, every time we can see you, like um, you're, you're very um, like smiley, always uh, feel very open to others. Is this part of your personality or is this something you work uh, on? It is just part of my personality. It's, it's not something that I've trained or that I've developed with skills. It, it's just a part of me. And, and that's why I believe that, uh, as you have mentioned uh, before, uh, that it, it resonates because it's, it's natural. It's just coming out uh, as, as it is, you know, without any, any filters, you know. And uh, it's, it's my natural, natural skill. Juan, we can say that you are some kind of ambassadors and spokesperson for our sport. You represented the FEI at multiple media platforms and also presented the FEI awards in 2018 and 2019. Yeah. Is this something that you do with a genuine intention of promoting your sports or it is natural for you? Both, both things. Uh, I, of course, uh, enjoy a challenge and uh, I, I decided to step up and uh, try, you know, give it a try in 2018 in Bahrain. And uh, in 2019, when they called me once again to do the Moscow, I, I said, of course, you can count with me because uh, all challenges, I, I think, are, are good, uh, both for uh, personal growth and for testing, for trying new things. And uh, of course, I would like to become uh, an ambassador uh, for, the, for the sport, uh, but also uh, an ambassador for the youth, you know, because I, I want to encourage in, in the young riders the... the um, the hope that you know you can try things and you can uh, see how you and, and test 
and uh, little by little decide whether it will be your path or it won't. But don't be afraid, you know, to give things a try and to test and uh, to challenge uh, yourself. You also were granted um, a couple of years ago, I think, the Ambassador of Self-Advancement Award uh, at the New York Summit, right? Um, that was, ladies, that was crazy. Yeah? That was crazy. Wow. In Marbella with the super crazy gala with celebrities, very important uh, people. Uh, I, I was really proud of this, of this award. And uh, to be, uh, the, the, it was the Superación, superación Personal, the personal... Uh, su oh. Uh, over, over, Overcome, over, overcoming, overcoming, of, yeah. Yeah, overcoming of uh, personal challenges and uh, wow, that was really a, a wonderful weekend and I got to meet many inspirational uh, personalities and uh, yeah, that was such a, such a great award. So if I'm right, this is a title that aims to um, celebrate Hispanic um, yes. leadership in the world yes. and, and make visible how much Latino communities con contribute to the history of the planet. Um, is this something you really believe in? You know, is this uh, something you advocate for? Of course. Representing uh, your community, representing yes. Latinos. And, yes, yeah. that, 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 that is a huge pride. And uh, it was um, an honor to be able to receive it. Uh, and I was accompanied by the doctor that saved my life, mm -hmm. the doctor Claudio Rodriguez, and, and his, his children. And uh, yeah, it, it was uh, a beautiful, beautiful weekend. And of course, my parents were also there. And uh, it, was, it was an altogether fantastic time. Yeah. So maybe we can talk about it. You talked, uh, right? You just talked about the doctor that mm -hmm. saved your life. Yes. Um, so. When talking about you, we cannot not speak about your accident. So it was two years ago now, yes. yeah? You were hospitalized and put in an artificial coma for three weeks. Um, and well, less than a year later, you were back winning and performing at the highest level. <laughs> um, so last week you won the Grand Prix. Um, how much has this accident shaped the way you're riding now, the way you're um, living, living hmm. yeah, your life? It has given me perspective. It has given me straight up uh, perspective and a chance to take it slow and, and, and appreciate the, the little things, you know, even the, the little hiccups, the little fights, the little arguments with my father, of course, being my, my, my trainer and the horse owner. Um, it, it has just shaped uh, my, my future, it has given me a much brighter, uh, a much brighter scope, I believe it's called. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it's just... Uh, The, the, big, the biggest gift that I've, that I've had, I've received. Actually, this scar that I have on my throat from the trichotomy that I've, that I've had uh, is, a, is a daily reminder of uh, what my family and I have been through and the many ups and downs. Because at the end of the day, it's just a, uh, an, an example, one more example to us uh, of what life is. You know, that there are many ups and downs. One day we're here and the next day we cannot be. And uh, it's something that we must... Uh, realize and be aware of and uh, thank God every single day, you know, because uh, every day is a gift. Uh, whether you're a believer or whether you're not, uh, every day is a gift. And, you know, to be surrounded by your loved ones, by your family, by our horses, by our, by our team is uh, the biggest uh, gift that we, can, that we can have and we must be appreciative. And um, do you think that you're riding differently now than in the past? Like, do you consider competitions differently? Do you prepare differently? Do you happen to do things in a different way? Or do you just do the same but with much more uh, consciousness about it? I'm trying to stretch <laughs> a little bit more. <laughs> no, okay. but uh, I, I'm doing pretty much the same things that, I, that I've been doing. Uh, if anything, I'm going inside the arena with even more hunger, even more uh, de desire. Uh, to get high percentages and to reach for the top uh, because already before the accident I believe I was quite ambitious and uh, but now it's even got it to a 2.0 uh, version uh, because I want it and, and, I, and uh, the, the desire is there and uh, I'm, I'm realizing that uh, with uh, a thought in your mind you can turn it into a reality. I quote an article that I read, you say that I had so much love and affection from other riders and the audience that was there. I was applauded nicely before and after tests. This whole episode has made me appreciate the equestrian community. When I first opened my phone in the hospital, I had thousands of messages on WhatsApp and social media. There are so much support and love. Has the support you received when you were in the hospital changed the way you considered the equestrian community? Do you feel that you have a stronger sense of belonging? 
You gave me goosebumps <laughs> just just now by 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 no by by by, re, by hearing those words that I had uh, written, um, because the the love, the support, the encouragement, the messages, the phone calls, the emails that I'm still to answer many of them. I, I tried to answer one by one, uh, but uh, there, there's not enough thank yous. You know, there's there's uh, just not enough uh, gratitude that I can give uh, to these people because. Uh, Yeah, th those two months that I was in the hospital, they were quite challenging and they were quite tough. But even, you know, I, I don't think I've ever talked about this, but um, even the months that I was no longer in the hospital, even the, the recovery until I was competing again in April 2021, it's been, it was tough. Every single day I had to go to a, to a rehabilitation center. I had to go to a psychologist. I had to go to this. I had to go to that. The doctors, phew, it was really challenging, eh? But uh, I became stronger and I, I became even more resilient and even more hungry and even more ambitious than before. And, uh, you know, until I'm just where I am today. Uh, it's, it's shaped me and I believe that uh, in, in the future I will continue to look back at the pictures and the videos that we have uh, on our phones, which is what's crazy to me, that we have all the content on our phones because just a quick snap or a quick video can, could, can be taken at any second. And... Uh, just to look back and say hey all right take it slow and just realize where you've gone and where, where you where you were and where you are now and appreciate you know and uh, enjoy have a good time and uh, take it easy but without losing the the focus yeah. what did you miss most um when you were in the hospital was it horses was it sport <laughs> was it to be free <laughs> okay i'm going to say something really funny <laughs> that uh, i told my parents when i was in icu that I wanted to eat jamón, ham, okay. Spanish ham. <laughs> yeah. I, would, I, I, couldn't, I could not speak. I could only whisper and I would say to my parents, eh, Dad, Mom, I want ham, jamón, jamón. I was so hungry. And uh, what, what, did you, what did you just ask? Though? I, I don't know why I said uh, like, that. I said, what did you miss most? But I was uh, yeah, thinking yeah. about horses or sport. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Maybe not jamón. <laughs> yeah. No, but, uh, okay, of course, I would ask my parents every, um, every day and if not every other day how my team was, how my horses were training. I would, I would have these uh, flashbacks to horses that I was riding in the past. That's something that's most interesting to me, how my memory uh, was working, you know, because uh, I, I could not remember that I had won the World Championships of PRE Horses, and that was just six months uh, before it all happened, in, in November 2019. And so when my parents uh, told me, because my parents were, of course, of course, testing, you know, in which area of the mind uh, it was affected, which part of the memory was altered, Uh, and they, they, did not, they did not know, so they were asking me all of these questions to see where I lost uh, the memory. And uh, when they told me that I had one, I could not stop crying because I, I could not believe it. Uh, so anyway, I, 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 remember, I remember that I would ask my parents uh, how my horses, how my team was, and uh, they were telling me that everything was good, that the horses were training well, and that they were just getting ready for me to, to go back, and that the... The team missed me, and uh, that, of course, would make me cry even more and would make me very emotional. Yeah. Well, we talk about it, uh, Juan. You live partly in Europe, partly here mm -hmm. in the U.S. You live, compete, and work in both markets. Can you tell us about the differences between Europe and the U.S. equestrian systems uh, in dressage? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the sport uh, is, is um, largely more focused in the sport in Europe. I believe, and in the U.S., uh, it's the market uh, for sales and for business. And uh, although in, it's now in, in, in Wellington, of course, and in the in the uh, in the West Coast in California, also the, the sport is increasing and growing every day. And the clients and the riders that are in in the states are is getting much much better and uh, much more competitive. Uh, in Europe, is uh, of course it has the upper hand because that's where the sport originated. That's where the sport started. Um, so that's that's the idea and that's the goal that I had, you know, in 2018 when I went back to Europe to live. Uh, th that the top and the best are there. Uh, however, the clients and the sponsors are here, and so I must be combining. I must be in both places at once. Yeah. We are here just since two days now in Wellington, and I noticed that the business is really different mm. here in Wellington yeah. than in Europe and in France. Mm. Yeah, the market here is very different and um, the education, mm -hmm. like the writing education system as well. Yep. And um, we know that we, we often, very often talk with, with our um, guests in the podcast about, you know, the flat classes for ponies and everything. Mm -hmm. um, 
you started writing a little bit here. Yeah. Uh, you were here in the US. Do you think that the, this American writing education is actually like better, you know, uh, educating better or training better writers because of those black pony the classes influence. which are very different from what we can see in Europe for, for, for pony? Yeah, uh, sure. I, I believe that the influence of the European uh, writers in the States is a big influence. Uh, because of course the the, the best uh, everyone looks always up to the best uh, writers and uh, in the states there is uh, a lot of hunger for uh, trying to achieve uh, this in the sport and uh, yeah there, there are many there are many uh, clients there are many parents that want their children uh, to uh, make it into the sport and into the top and uh, this is of course a, a big big market um, but uh, okay I believe also in Europe uh, everyone okay worldwide Worldwide, you know, people are trying to make it in the sport and make it to the top ranks. And this, of course, has, uh, you know, costs a lot of effort and, uh, of course, money. And this is uh, something that is a reality, uh, but uh, something that can give uh, a lot of uh, ideas, you know, to many people worldwide. Hmm. But I have the feeling that it's very different when you start writing here as a kid. Mm -hmm. For example, you want, well, um, okay, I'm talking about show jumping because this is what I know, mm -hmm. sorry. But uh, for example, show jumpers, they would, the, the, the kids wouldn't start jumping before they are able, you know, to flat ride and mm -hmm. to uh, have nice canter and everything. Yeah. Well, when in, in France, for example, they would start um, trying to win the class uh, mm -hmm. with a chronometer, etc. Mm -hmm. Do you feel the same? Do you, do you feel that? or is this for you or in dressage like basically the same education at first I mean you, you must first before you go into a show into a competition arena be able to master the skills at home you yeah. know so this is uh, worldwide uh, it doesn't matter the sport that you do it doesn't matter whether you're a beginner or whether you are a professional we have, before we go into a, the ring or into the arena we must be ready uh, and this doesn't matter whether if you're in the States or in Spain or in yeah, France totally. you know Uh, but uh, yeah, I, th I think that the, the, the different paths that the riders uh, can take are all, you know, they can all, all work. Uh, however, depending on the professional that you have uh, recommending and suggesting and training uh, can make a big difference in the results. And in, and in this, in, in how quickly you can achieve those results. And the quality of a horse is yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. That is also, of course, a big influence. You, you, you need, uh, the thing is that I always say that it's a 70% uh, of the importance in the quality of the horse and a 30% in the rider, um, at least in the dressage. I, 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 I'm not so sure about in show jumping, uh, but, uh, you know, without one or without the other, you can't uh, get a successful uh, combination. You said uh, during the introduction that you started uh, being a show jumper. Mm -hmm. So, do you think that he this shaped the way you ride now? Um, has he did it did it have any influence on your riding on your career as a rider? It it did because it um, instilled in me uh, the um, the idea of having fun and just cantering and just trying to go for the win and. Uh, going fast you know just riding competitively because I believe that many many young uh, riders uh, that are starting in dressage uh, become a little bit too conservative too too prudent you know too uh, worried about the about the speed about the uh, lengthening and about the overall just uh, riding you know and I think it's it's uh, the best uh, to start in, in show jumping and actually in eventing because you have also an introduction to dressage So, Juan, I quote something you said in another interview. Mm -hmm. You said, I want to be in the top sport and must take every opportunity I can. And you just said at the beginning of our interview, what are your dreams now and ambition for the next couple of years? Okay. You talk about Paris. Yes. But maybe. Okay, I'd like to make it um, in the World Cup final uh, in Leipzig uh, just next month. Uh, and I'd also like to make it into the WEG uh, 2022 WEG in uh, Copenhagen, I believe. Yeah, and uh, but that's just for this year. Uh, next year, I, the, the the goals will continue coming. Uh, I, the thing is, I, I don't like to just straight up say share my goals for every single year of the following of my future in the career. Uh, but uh, I'll have to take it a step at a time. Uh, but of course, the goal is always to make it in the Olympic Games. Uh, And uh, yeah, I, I believe that you, when you have a goal set ahead of yourself, uh, you can ride and you can improve and you can uh, work hard and make the effort and uh, try to learn and try to take as much information as you can in and learn and grow and yeah, try, try to reach the top. 
So you must be building the system to bring you to be performing, you know, and reach this top. And um, we know that you train with your father, for example. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit, well, first about your father, the mm -hmm. relationship you have with him and the way you work together and uh, the way he has influenced also um, your sport and mm -hmm. your career. And then the system you are building, like the people you, you, you would be working with mm -hmm. and the way you work with, the, with these persons. Okay, my, my father is the biggest inspiration, uh, both uh, as a rider, as a father figure, and as a horse owner, as a, yeah, um, a partner. He's uh, my, my teammate, and uh, he's the leader, of course. That's something that I must always uh, keep in track and keep uh, reminding myself that he's the alpha. He's the one that I must follow uh, because I, I, I'm young. I'm 24 years old, and, of course, at times I, I can also get a little bit cocky. Uh, and my father all the time, with a whip, smacks him and says, hey, humble. You know, you have to be humble and you have to keep uh, steady and keep uh, uh, under control. And um, yeah, it, it's every single day, it's, it's a challenge uh, with, with him. Uh, but I think this is positive because uh, one, can only, one can only learn and one can only uh, grow um, from here. And uh, yeah, even though at first it, it used to be a bit even more challenging, every single day we would have argues, every, every single day we would have fights, every single day I, was, I, was, uh, I had my doubts of whether I would want to pursue a, a name in this, in this sport uh, to share with my family and uh, of course it was very challenging, uh, but I'm glad that I did not, uh, I did not take the wrong decision and uh, stopped and quit it because uh, if I would have, I wouldn't have uh, been where I am uh, today. Um, but yeah, I, I can only say that I, I love my father and every single day when we argue, I ask for forgiveness. I ask, I, Dad, I, I apologize. I apologize I was being a little bit cocky. I apologize that I was being a bit arrogant and, uh, and I did not listen so much. Uh, but uh, yeah, my father and I have a great relationship. Is he the only person with uh, whom you, you train? Or do you have other trainers or people you, you'd be working with you know, to, uh, to learn? Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, I've ridden also with the different uh, trainers, uh, of course, national uh, coaches um, that have worked uh, for the Spanish Federation, uh, but he's the 99.9% of the uh, trainers that I've uh, worked with. Um, okay, I've also uh, taken in advice uh, from different uh, trainers, uh, different judges, uh, but uh, he's, yeah, he, I'm my father's uh, student and will always uh, be so, I believe. You said, can you tell us the age uh, Quantico is? Yes, he's 16 years old now. Okay, you said he would be uh, 17 by the time WEG will Eight, happen? Yeah, seven, no, yeah. 16, he will 16. be 16 it's by the time this, uh, this, okay. this summer, 16, and uh, by Paris he will be 18. Yeah, by Paris. Um, how do you manage um, your string of horses mm -hmm. to be able to go? Do you okay, so that's, sorry for, sorry for interrupting you just now, Lorelai, but... Uh, um, that's something that I also wanted to mention from the previous question, that uh, the string of horses that I have, uh, they, they all vary in, uh, in ages. Uh, so, for example, Quantico is right now my uh, oldest horse, my Grand Prix horse, uh, but my next uh, horse in the string of horses that I have at home in my team is uh, 10 years old this year, and he'll be ready to do the Grand Prix debut uh, in the coming months or so. And then I also have uh, a really good 7-year-old, uh, Holsteinet, uh, and every single time we try to have a horse of different ages. You know, we try to have an, uh, every age. A six, five, four, three, uh, eight, nine, you know, we always try to have uh, all horses because they're, they're all for sale. You know, it's, it's a business. And uh, this is something that was uh, very uh, um, taught uh, to me when I was very young. And uh, it's, it's, we have to keep the business running. And when one sells, the next one is coming. And uh, when one doesn't sell, we keep him for sport. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's must continue evolving and continue uh, growing, and uh, and I would like to make it in in business myself uh, eventually too. I've actually also just now purchased my first horse, and uh, okay, not just in 2021, early 2021, uh, but I'm most excited because it's my first investment, my first uh, horse investment. And do you feel like uh, if Quantico is not able to make it um, mm -hmm. to Paris because too old at the time? I will find for sure a different uh, horse. Yeah. I will find a project for sure. Because where there is a will, there is a way. And when you have uh, such power, such belief in yourself, uh, you can always find uh, a collaboration. You can always find a, ho a horse owner. You can always find a project. Always. 
So there is one question that I love to ask uh, of our guest is uh, what is success for you, mm -hmm. Juan? And do you think you are already succeeded in your career? And considering everything that you've been through, do you feel like you are successful now? This is something that I was uh, just recently speaking about with, uh, with someone close to me. Um, The thing is that I don't think I am that successful. Like the thing is that I have such tunnel vision. The thing is that I have all the goals in front of me and I just focus on them that I forget to enjoy and, and to take all, all, the thing that, that, all the things that surround me in, you know? And uh, that's a question that uh, she asked me. Uh, she said, uh, do you realize the success? Do you, do you realize how, how successful you're being uh, so far and, and, and where you're headed and... Uh, And I just looked back and I said, no, I, I, I'm not realizing this. Okay, I'm, of course, aware that I've had successes, but I, I don't consider myself to be successful yet, you know, uh, because I always have the goal in front of me and, and I have the tunnel vision and I want to reach it, I want to reach it, that I forget to look back and say, whoa, uh, that's a pretty big deal that uh, we have acquired already. Uh, so, so this is a very humbling uh, opportunity for me to also just realize how, how far we, we are and how far we've, we've come. Uh, we're fourth at the moment in the World Cup uh, ranking. Uh, this is huge, ladies. This is, to me, unbelievable. Uh, and uh, most likely we will qualify for the World Cup final. And this is, yeah, a dream. A dream come true. This is a question. This might be one of the last mm -hmm. one. But um, we had the conversation with Peter Fredriksson, mm -hmm. which is world number one yeah. right now. In I, the I look out to him a lot. Swedish uh, yeah. writer. I look out He's to him incredible. a lot. He's incredible. And when we met him, he was at the very beginning of his uh, world number one title, you know, mm -hmm. it was December, so mm -hmm. it's been three months, two months, three months, something. And uh, so we asked that now that he's been world champion, not mm -hmm. world champion, but Olympic champion and um, multiple, multiple times one. medalist and world number one. Mm -hmm. Is this something, is this an endless process? You know, once you get to some point, you just want to go to the upper level. And do yeah. you feel it will be the same? Like right now, you said that your next ambition, your next uh, goal would be uh, the Olympics because it will be the first time mm -hmm. for you. And I know it means something. Because But I'm, of sure that I, I'm sure that once I make it, because I will hopefully achieve my goals and achieve sure. my dreams. Once I make it, I'm sure that I won't have enough. I won't have enough until I win the gold medal. And of course, I won't be winning the first gold medal once I make it for the first time in the team. Uh, and that, that will be a lifelong uh, process. And uh, it will be hard work. It will be, it will be a long journey. But already making it in, into that scene uh, will be a big achievement. And uh, I cannot wait for it because I will have uh, then uh, inherited my father's Olympic flag. And that is the goal that I've had since I started riding. You just want to inherit your yeah. father's flag, yeah, yeah. yeah? I do, I do. Okay, I don't just want to inherit his Olympic flag. I, of course, have many goals in the sport itself and in the business behind it, but uh, I want to inherit uh, his Olympic flag for sure. Okay, well, what can we wish for you? You know, uh, except for all those goals and everything, but is there anything that you wish uh, outside of sports? Well, I just uh, would wish uh, to have uh, success, uh, good health, uh, people that support and that love me and that uh, want to share this uh, journey, this lifelong journey uh, with me and that uh, I will always have this uh, support and uh, good health. At the end of the day, that's the most important. That's what I learned uh, from my 2020 experience and uh, that today we're here, but tomorrow we might not be. And we must just enjoy, smile and be happy. So may you remain healthy and successful in writing um, better and better. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>